background. So, all right, there we go. Um, uh, he's he's. I think he started his career in the military, and then he went into teaching, and he got into uh, lots of other things. But but then he got into fitness, and then helping people with their sedentary life. I don't know about you, but that sedentary life is uh, kind of my life, Monday through Friday. <laughs> So I'm excited to hear from him. But here's a fun fact. He was the he held the world record for uh, Macarena dancing. So uh, I think that's a really fun fact. So if that tells you anything about the guy, then uh, I, I think we have a lot of fun in store. So, uh, Mike, we're very, very happy and grateful that you're here. And we're looking forward to hearing all the wonderful things that you have to say. And so we're going to turn it over to you. It's all yours. All right. Thanks, Christy. Just to clarify, I didn't dance the Macarena alone. I was. <laughs> we set the record for the world's largest group dance at Yankee Stadium. 51,000 people dancing the Macarena. Wow. My whole, my whole life, I always wanted to set a world record. I chased after that goal, and that goal lasted the rest of my teenage years. And once we set that record when I was 19, that world record lasted the rest of the month. 60,000 Hoosiers at the Indiana State Fair broke my record when they danced the funky chicken. So it was good while it lasted. So now I need you to cheer me up. Are you in the mood for a high energy introduction or a low energy? What do you want? Let, let's just see by hand. You want high or low? I see hands up. Good, good, excellent. You want a low energy? Too bad. This is a fitness presentation. Well, think about if you are the speaker. What does your audience want? Does your audience want a high energy presentation? I would think so. We get thumbs up, thumbs down, usually yes. Okay, heads bobbing, good. Does your audience want stories that carry a message that they can repeat? Great. Does your, does your audience want to see a picture of you wearing a bikini or a Speedo? Okay, if your answer is no, then you're going to love the story you're about to hear. But first, yes, my name is Mike McQuillan. I'm the creator of Fit Presenter, which is the number one resource for public speaking in the fitness industry. So if you work in fitness, then people are desperate to know what you know. Now, if you don't work in fitness, you're in for double the benefit because not only are you going to get the same world-class speaking techniques to build your business, establish yourself as a leader in your field, but you can also expect to pick up some tips on exercise and fitness as well. So many people get their guidance in this field from TV, like shows like The Biggest Loser. You ever watch that show? Now, I've never seen it, but when someone came into our training studio asking us to host their Biggest Loser competition, we jumped all over it. I love training, but it can get kind of monotonous working with the same clients in each day of the week. Take the glasses off, the ring light refer, reflects. So when they said, let's do this, great. It's a new batch of people, get a chance to educate them, motivate. It's a competition. The three months of different activities they're going to do together, go grocery shopping together. And they said, we're going to use your facility to weigh in once a week, and they can come in and train as well. I said, great. We got excited. We, we set up the facility. We closed everything down, no sessions. We set up for the people to come in. First came the, the challenge coordinator, then came the contestants, and then in her high heels and her pretty red dress in walked the trainer. That's right. They hired an outside trainer to run this competition. And we were just a couple of patsies to set up the facility and stand there like models. I, how would you react to that? I looked over at the owner manager. I said, is that how it is? We do all the work and she comes in and gets all the business. <laughs> I looked at her and said, you have no idea what you're in for. And once she started speaking, I knew we had nothing to worry about. She came out and said, um, hi, um, uh, my name is, <laughs> name withheld, and um, I am uh, the trainer. And then she did that thing. You know, the, the thing with the one foot in front of the other, you know, that pose that says, well, I'm uh, not very happy to be here. And then what do you think she said? I'm very happy to be here. And then she handed out her flyer. If you had been sitting in that row of chairs, you would have gotten a piece of paper with her contact information. 
long list of credentials and self-congratulations, and a picture of herself wearing a bikini. Did I mention this was a weight loss competition? Our heaviest contestant weighed in at over 300 pounds, and she was in her mid-20s. Do you think maybe she's been struggling with this her whole life? And she's looking at this bikini pic thinking, where's the other half? No worries. The other half is on the way. If I can give you one quick tip in public speaking right now, people remember most what they hear last. Enter the fit presenter. I said, oh, before you go, I just want to say congratulations on taking this step here. Personally, I've never seen the show Biggest Loser, but here at One to One Fitness, we see that show every day. And I went on to tell them a story about a client I've been working with. Said, every day she walks out of the gym saying, I hate you. I hate you. Until one day, she at the end of the session, she said, you want to see these pictures of me? I said, okay. And I looked and it's a picture of her. She's not horseback riding or skydiving. She's just sitting there. I said, well, it's, uh, it's, it's very nice. And she said to me, this is the first time that I let anybody take a picture of me in five years. Six months and 48 pounds later, she met her goal and wore a dress to a family wedding instead of a pantsuit. I'll never forget that last session before the wedding when she walked out saying, I did it. I really did it. And I still hate you. How do you think that audience reacted that day? Everybody in that group signed up for personal training with us. In less than five minutes of speaking, we generated over $5,000 in revenue from personal training fees. And if they had come from a tighter radius geographically, we would have doubled that money easily. Can you now see the importance of public speaking to promote your business? All that other trainer could do is <laughs> she could just stand there looking like, and I know she was by no means a horrible person, by the way. She's very nice. She's done well for herself as a vegan chef. I don't know if she's training. I'd give her a plug here, but maybe I shouldn't do that. <laughs> but in that moment, all she could do is look over thinking, I don't understand. They love me on social media. Have you ever seen fitness people flexing on Facebook, twerking on TikTok, eating salads on Instagram? I'm better than you. I'm better than you. I'm better than you. By the way, just if you think I'm picking on women, men are no better. Plenty of bodybuilding, male speakers up there, they put up their bodybuilding pic with the Speedo, the spray tan, the baby oil. You're not doing yourselves any favor. Yes, yeah, social media casts a broader net, but nothing makes a deeper connection to promote your business than public speaking. And the number one venue to promote is in your facility. Like I say, I do this in the fitness industry. Your gym floor is a million dollar speaking venue, but your office, your place of business, as you can see right now, is the best venue to speak and promote your business. And the next, let's say 30, 45 minutes, you're going to get the three tools to build your reputation as an industry leader using my signature fit system. That is F-I-T, hence the name Fit Presenter. So every most of what you're going to hear today is in the context of fitness. So that's my payback because most of my training is in the context of boardrooms and conference rooms. I just want to test your knowledge of fitness, just very, ba uh, very basic knowledge. I have one question for you. I'm going to pull out the grid so I can see you. And I have one question for you. It's a multiple choice question. Spot reduction, which is to reduce body fat from one specific part of the body. Where is it most effective? Is it A, your abdominals, B, on your buttocks, C, your upper arm, or D, on your brain? I'll tell you what, why don't you point to it? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Somebody got it right. If you have to stand up to point to it, you got the wrong answer, and it is D, brain. And sorry, it's only 10 o'clock in the morning where I am. There won't be any live demonstrations. You cannot spot reduce your extra cargo. 
Your body puts it wherever it wants to. If you went on a binge on Thanksgiving, gain 20 pounds, and please don't. But if you do, and it all goes to your feet, you won't be able to walk. So your body knows where to have, where to distribute its extra cargo. So spot reduction is a myth. But that doesn't stop the industry, does it? Have you ever seen a gadget that promises to reduce body fat from one specific part of the body without training any other part of the body? Have you ever bought a gadget like that? It's okay, don't worry, don't feel bad if you have. I've, As a fitness professional, I bought into plenty of fitness gimmicks myself. But spot reduction is the biggest myth going in exercise, but it's not the only myth. In fact, whenever I'm interviewing a trainer for a position, the first question I ask is, tell me one misconception that you've had about fitness that's been cleared up with your experience. You won't believe how many people are not willing to answer that question. Just as a teaser, I'm going to ask you that question in just a few minutes. I think of I think of Tom. I interviewed one time. I said, Tom, tell me about a misconception you've had about fitness. And he said, mm -hmm. well, actually, I've never had any misconceptions because I was taught by the right people and trained the right way. I look back thinking, guess what, Tom? Congratulations. We just found your first misconception. Nobody wants to own up to being less than perfect. So I'll make a deal with you. I'll go first. I will answer the question that Tom did not want to answer. And I'll give you one misconception that I've had about fitness. And then it's your turn. Tell me about one misconception you've had in your industry. Raise your hand if you like to play golf. I see a couple of hands up. Okay, you notice my hand is not up. I'm not a golfer. Maybe it's because I'm too fidgety. Maybe it's because I'm left-handed. Either way, golf is not my thing. And that's why I used to believe that golf was a zero-impact sport. It's a light stick. It's a small ball. How bad can it be? Until one day, a client came in saying, Hi, Mike. I said, what happened to you? She said, golf. This particular client I've been working with for about a year, and she went from being a sedentary, deconditioned couch potato to running a half a marathon, and she crushed it. Came back two days later saying, hey, that was fun. One round of golf, she comes in twisted up like a French crawler. Started to make a donut reference here in a fitness presentation, but that's what she looked like. It turns out, even though it's a light stick, you have to rotate and the light stick 270 degrees, and most people turn at the spine instead of the hip like they're supposed to, arch their back into that dreaded C curve to drive that little ball a couple hundred yards, plus the short game, times 18 holes, long walking, prolonged standing, occasional visits from the beverage cart for a few rounds of uh, spot reduction. Golf takes its toll on the body. So I learned something that day. Did you just learn something? Okay, now it's your turn. I'm going to put on my glasses here so I can see in the chat window. Type one misconception that you've had about your industry. And please, no cliches. Don't say, well, I thought it would be easy or, uh, you know. Don't judge a book by its cover. But in the chat window, I'd like to see a misconception that you've had about your industry that has been cleared up through experience. Let's see some answers now. In the meantime, I'll sing, and I'm free, free falling. Yes, Bill, I love that all business coaches are alike. I see, a lot, I see some very good business coaches. I see a lot that just want to project their misery onto their clients. Very good. Good, Christy, yes. Cool. Hey, Kelly, what is your business that people thought it would be boring? <laughs> accounting you know what i'm so glad you say that kelly because my other idea i always come up with these terrible ideas after fit presenter i wanted to do fin presenter for finance people because numbers tell stories and yes, that's, that's why i was an economics major in college and you're going to hear that in just a few minutes i don't want to let's see here 
as as was I, by the way, economics oh. and history with a with a with a little bit of an Asia event, a, a Asia orientation to it. All right, hang in there, Russ. I've got a story for you in just a few minutes. It's coming. No so hang in. Okay. All right, these no are problem. really good misconceptions, and yes. The economy, people talk about the bad, you keep talking about the bad economy, your economy is going to be bad. Yeah, hard work is not enough. Very good, Tim. Okay, Cindy says, apologies, I had to jump off. That is another misconception, but okay, thanks for stopping by, Cindy. Lifting weights will give me huge muscles. Yes, in the fitness world, women say, I don't want to lift weights. It drives me nuts. I saw a, a celebrity trainer saying, women should never lift more than three pounds. So if your baby weighs more than three pounds, what do you do? Kick them down the street on a skateboard? These are all very good. Ah, Norwalk, Connecticut. I used to live. Oh wow! Hang in there, Russ. We'll, we'll get to uh, we'll get to posting your network uh, information later. But yes, all these misconceptions are true, and they're very good. But I have to ask you a question: These misconceptions you have, or you've had in the past, are they completely wrong, or just partially wrong? I look at some say accounting could be boring. Well, it is kind of boring. It's partially boring, exactly. You know, lifting weights, uh, we're not going to turn you into the Hulk, but they will build muscles and that's something to be concerned about, okay? Same thing with golf. Golf is not a zero impact sport, but it's not rugby. It's not kickboxing. It's not downhill BMX. So even with the misconceptions that we have, there's still a grain of truth that exists within the misconceptions. That's inherent. If you gave a lesson on astrophysics, I wouldn't have any misconceptions because I know nothing about astrophysics. But the more you know, the more misconceptions you're going to have. I always liken it to this. Your knowledge is like this glass of water. It has the hydration you need, but it also has impurities in it. Luckily for me, this water is filtered. And that is the F in the FIT system to filter your audience's misconceptions from their background knowledge. Show them that even when they're wrong, they're still a little bit right. Have you ever seen a presentation, a teacher or a speaker who says, forget everything you know about this subject. Everything you've been taught is wrong. Then why am I here? I would, that's the most disrespectful thing you can say to an audience. I don't know what you know. It's right to say, okay, something you've been taught is wrong. But what does your audience think when, okay, well, what does that say to your audience? Well, I'm smart and you're stupid. I'm right, you're wrong. But somehow you are smart enough to learn everything I'm going to teach you. That's no way to do it. Instead, you filter. Show them that even when they're wrong, they still know something. And filtering is a two-part process. Address and confess. Confess you just did. Doesn't it feel good to get it out there, tell people that you used to have misconceptions? What is the audience going to say when you come clean and say, I used to believe this, but now I learned that? Are they going to say, what? You're not perfect? Well, forget it. No, they're going to see you on their level. Even if you're physically up higher than they are, they're going to see you on their level. The other part is address. And this is something I'd like you to do. I always want to give you some kind of task as we're working. If you have a pen and paper, write down three misconceptions that you expect your audience to have about what you do. So if you give up and give a get up and give a speech about accounting, engineering, economics, business coaching, what are three misconceptions that you expect your audience to have? and then identify the grain of truth that exists within the myth. I'll give you a minute or so to write that down. So many times I see the five things you're doing wrong. It's like, well, how do you know I'm doing them wrong? Well, either I am making those mistakes and now you're insulting me, or I'm not making those mistakes and you're wasting my time. But if you say, okay, this is a mistake, this is a misconception people have, this was true about it. Hell, that won't filter the water. I'll keep quiet for 30 seconds so you can write it down. Hey, Macarena. I'm going to play with my camera while you're doing that.
still here, don't worry. Okay, now you can always finish that later, but I want to make sure that you acknowledge that when you're speaking to an audience, they know things that you don't, you know things that they don't, but as long as you address that truth within the mythology that they believe in, they're going to say, hey, I know more than I thought I did on this subject. What else do I know? And once they get into that mindset of, wow, what else do I know? Now they're ready for you to be the teacher. Well, if you're thinking teacher, I didn't even want to be a speaker. Now I have to be a teacher? No worries. And uh, this, is, this is for the economists in the room. I'm going to... I'm going to start what I always do with the movies. I'm going to give you a line, a, a scene from a movie and type in the chat window when you figure it out. <clears throat> in 1930, the Republican controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the, anyone, anyone, the Great Depression, passed the tariff bill, the, anyone, the Holly Smoot tariff. Do you know the movie? Yes. Good job, Bill. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. That is Ben Stein. Yes, that is Ben Stein explaining the Holy Smoot Tariff and its effect on the Great Depression. Bill and I are economics majors. I would have been in that classroom saying, oh, oh, I know, I know, Mr. Stein, I know. But what are the students doing? Sleeping? Drooling? The one student is blowing the, the chewing the bubble gum, blowing a bubble? <laughs> Is that what you want from your audience? You want them sleeping, texting, hitting alt tab and checking, checking their LinkedIn? I see you out there. Now, what do you want from your audience? And I'd like to, you to put that in the chat window as well. Type this in. I want my audience to, and then fill in the blank. Hmm, I'll get this camera fixed. Put your glasses here, good. Engage, laugh, remember, excellent, all good. Any specific calls to action from your presentation? Implement, good, Greg. What, what kind of call to action? Let's be specific. If it's your topic, like for example, at the end of this, I want you to implement the FIT system to give a presentation to establish yourself as a leader in your industry. What do you really want that audience to do at the end? Okay, take one more answer here. Okay, that's good. To engage that audience, to get them to resonate, to get them to laugh, to get them to be part of it, you need the I in the FIT system. Now take a guess, what does the I stand for? Let's check out that chat window, see what we have here. What do you think the I stands for? The F is filter, the I is it's a verb, actually. Uh, Bill. Intent. Huh? Well, Greg says implement, almost close. Okay. The word is in. Okay. Marilyn says informed. Very good guess, but I didn't like inform you. Not exactly. Initiate. Thank you for initiating that answer, Kelly and John, but very good. The answer is instruct. And you instruct. What do you think? Do we instruct with slides and bullet points or do we instruct with stories and examples? Yes, very good, Bill. F is filter, I is instruct. Very good. We instruct with stories. Have you heard any stories so far? We've been at this for about 20 minutes. Any stories so far? What have we heard? The bikini trainer? And what's the lesson from that? Don't go on stage with a bikini? <laughs> How do you know? What else? The woman who lost the weight, the golfer, Tom, the Holy Smoot tariff, its effect on the Great Depression. There's at least five stories in 20 minutes. Not bad, right? Let me ask you, have you heard any stories about me swimming across the Arctic Ocean from Alaska to the Laplands? No, any stories about me hiking up a volcano and surfing down on a patch of lava? Any stories about me winning the Olympic medal, the Nobel Peace Prize, and the school spelling bee all on the same day? Well, that story comes later. 
these stories, I have to admit, here's a misconception I had. I used to believe that the only stories worth telling are the ones that are outrageous, the ones that have to have explosions and bombs. I grew up in the 80s watching action films when I wasn't watching Ferris Bueller. And when I joined the Marines after high school, I was very fortunate. I got into their journalism program. They trained me to be a combat correspondent. I said, I'm going to travel the world. Anytime there's some kind of uprising, any kind of conflict, any kind of strife, I will be there to tell the story. I will be the warrior poet. I will be the hero. And people will remember me forever. And then they stationed me at a supply depot in Barstow, California, in the middle of the Mojave Desert. Anytime... Well, if there was a ribbon cutting, I got to take pictures of the ribbon cutting ceremony, a lot of grip and grin awards presentations. If a warehouse got new eco-friendly light bulbs, I was there to cover it. But I was prepared for this. The military trains its journalists at the Defense Information School in Fort Meade, Maryland. Do you know what else is at Fort Meade? The National Security Agency the headquarters for all signals intelligence for the U.S. military. So do you think we as journalism students who were free to walk around post just taking pictures of all the shiny buildings? No. Most of what we did was in the building. A lot of spotlight features on faculty members. They love that. Occasional golf tournament, but I wasn't interested in golf. Anytime the vending machines got restocked, I was. we were all there taking pictures. <laughs> What's in B7 today? Oh, Necco wafers. Awesome. I remember talking to an instructor. Oh, I was almost finished with the school. I was talking to an instructor. He was a civilian instructor named Mr. Benuzowitz, a retired Air Force Master Sergeant, now working as a civilian instructor. And I said, you know, I can't wait to get out into the field and start telling real stories. And he said, well, these are real stories. And that's your job as a journalist is to take stories that don't seem exciting and make them exciting. And he said something I'll never forget. He said, anybody can write about a train wreck. He's right. How hard is it to tell a story that tells itself? Anybody can write about a train wreck. I have to quote Mark Brown, 1995 world champion of public speaking, who said, don't speak to be sensational, speak to be sincere. <clears throat> so in your case, the story to start with, and don't tell just one story, but the story to start with is real simple. What do you know about your industry that you wish that everybody knew? We already talked about misconceptions that people bring, but what do you wish that everybody knew? And the other question is, how did you learn it? What do you know? How did you learn that? You put that into a story, and now you are teaching through storytelling. And the great thing about stories is people will remember the story. They'll tell it, and they will carry your message long after you're finished speaking. All you need now is a message, and that is the T in the fifth system. But first, a quick review. The F is to filter their misconceptions from their background knowledge, show them that you respect the knowledge that they bring to the presentation. Just like I know this is not the first lesson you've ever had in storytelling. The I is instruct with stories. They won't remember your bullet points. They will remember your stories. And the T, <clears throat> well, it doesn't stand for telephone, but it does involve the phone call that should have saved, should have changed my life. Let me save my life. Should have changed my life. Now, I don't know exactly. I didn't get, I know we have somebody from Connecticut. Anybody else here from the greater New York area by chance? Yeah, let me just check and see. All right, we have some hands up. Yes, Alina, very cool. All right, Alina, maybe you can help me here. What is the number one top 40 pop radio station in New York City? Z, Z. Z100. Z100, <laughs> broadcasting from the top of the Empire State Building. Now, me, I'm a rock and roll guy. I do enjoy some Tom Petty. So I was never a huge fan of of Z100, but I did know it well enough because it's the biggest <laughs> station out there. So one day, 
about 30 years ago. I was a teenager. The phone rang at home. I answered, uh, uh, um, hello? This is Elvis Duran from Z100. Tell me what is the phrase that pays? And I said, Z100 means today's best music. Now give me my money. You want a thousand dollars. I can hear the bells. I can hear the sirens. I can hear the click. He hung up on me. Elvis Duran hung up the phone. I should have won a thousand dollars. Instead, he hung up. I ended up with nothing. Raise your hand if your name is Elvis Duran. Yeah, if you're out there, Elvis, I'm good with I'm in good with the management here at PRG. I know. <laughs> Those phone taps. Yes. <sighs> 30 years later, I still remember the story. But I also remember the phrase that pays. In the speaking world, we call it a foundational phrase or we call it a message statement. But that is what you need for your audience to remember the stories that you tell. Some kind of phrase. And here's the key. Ten words is a guideline. Of course, my favorite foundational phrase is 12 words, learn from the past, live in the present, look to the future, but it has good enough rhythm and the functional language is short enough. If you can package that story up in 10 words or less, then your audience will repeat that phrase. So if you can't think of anything off the bat, tell your story, tell it to a friend. If you're part of Toastmasters, which I strongly recommend, tell that story to an audience in Toastmasters. Anywhere you can tell the story and see what lesson they get from it. And from that lesson, you get your phrase. Have you heard any foundational phrases today? You probably did, didn't even notice. Anybody can write about a train wreck. Even when they're wrong, they're a little bit right. You know what? If you have teenagers at home and it's the weekend, they want to borrow the car, they want to go out, they have some crazy argument why they should be allowed to do whatever they want. And you're going to say, they don't know any. These kids think they know everything. Meanwhile, they know nothing. And then you say, you know what? Even when they're wrong, they're a little bit right. Address their misconception first. Identify the grain of truth that's in there. And then bottle that up in a foundational phrase. Oh, parenting made easy, but that's outside the scope of what we're doing. Package what you do into that foundational phrase and people will remember it exactly as you tell it. Now, if you don't give them a phrase, they're going to decide on their own what to remember. And I learned that one the hard way. <clears throat> My sport is wrestling. Here in Peru, I gave it, I didn't mention I live in Lima, Peru. Not a lot of wrestling here, but I, back in the States, is always near a wrestling mat. If I wasn't hired to be a coach, I was volunteering at my old high school. And one year I was volunteering at my old high school and we're at the county championships. This is the end of the season. You win the county championship, you move on to the States. Everybody else, season is over. And a kid on my team was named Andrew. He was a freshman at the time. And he's going up against a returning state champion. And the kid's a senior. The first time they wrestled, the state champion pinned him in under a minute. Now he's getting ready for his rematch here. He loses. His season is over. So I went up to him before the match. I said, what do you have planned? And he said, uh, I don't know. Now, if you're a wrestler, you know exactly what he has planned. In boxing, we have what's called a haymaker. Just throw one punch as hard as you can. Hope it lands and the fight's over. You don't have to get boxed. In wrestling, the equivalent is a headlock. Wrap up his neck, pull his arm, whip him to the mat. Hopefully you pin him as quickly as you can. <clears throat> so I went, I said, most people in your position would try a headlock. Try to whip him to his, mat, to his back and pin him quickly. I said, not you, not today. So we got to work on a technique that I call aggressive defense. Let him grab onto something and then fight it off. Let him grab your wrist, then knock his hand off your wrist. Let him get an underhook, which is kind of under the armpit there. Let him get the underhook, then push him away. Let him grab your neck, then shrug him off. So let him get started, but don't let him get set. Now, that's a pretty cool foundational phrase. Problem is, back then, I didn't know anything about foundational phrases. So I just said, yeah, yeah, like grab this and do that and push him like that and go like this and do this and do that. And, yeah, it's going to work. Well, he went out on the mat 
and he did it. And guess what happened? He got pinned again. But this time, he lasted almost to the end of the second period, almost four minutes after being pinned in under a minute previously by a returning state champion. That was a very good performance. In fact, the wrestler, you can look him up. His name is Johnny Greshheimer. He won that tournament, won a second state title. He went on to have a successful career at Edinburgh University. But after that match, people are walking around the arena saying, oh, no, what's wrong with Johnny Greshheimer? And I'm looking over thinking, <laughs> I'm what's wrong with Johnny Greshimer. It's nice to live vicariously through your athletes, especially when it's only a freshman. Now that other wrestler, he's done very well for himself too. His name is, uh, well, his name is Andrew. He won, uh, he won two county championships. He was fourth place in New York State. And when he was a senior, he said to me, coach, I remember what you told me that day. Three years later, I remember what you told me that day. He said, you'd said, don't get killed. I never said that. I never said anything like that. But I didn't tell him what to remember. So he decided on his own. That's what I said. And now forever, I'm known as the don't get killed guy. I know you, you're the don't get killed guy, right? No, I'm not the don't get killed guy. Here's my advice. Don't get killed. With no foundational phrase. Take everything and package it up into those 10 words. Now, if you're thinking, well, 10 words, I put in all this work to tell these stories, put in a message, and now it's only, I have to reduce it to 10 words? No, you don't reduce it to 10 words. You package it up in 10 words so that they can open it up and tell the full story. And this way, your audience will remember your message. Now, if you're thinking, audience, I don't have an audience. I'm not a professional speaker. Why do I care about this? I remember when I used to believe the same thing and I learned the hard way. Now, this next story doesn't, this next story takes place in fantasy land. Do you have a fantasy land? A place where you would live, never mind the job, cost of living, housing, where your family is. If there's one place, if you could just live there and everything else was the way you wanted it to be, where is that fantasy land for you? And please type in the chat window. If you can live anywhere, I you would live. Bora Bora. Okay. <clears throat> Southern California, just not uh, not in Barstow in the desert. <coughs> Tokyo. We've got some really cool places. <coughs> As we're doing this, let's review the fit system now. Filter, instruct, and then the T with the phrase is to transfer the lesson. You give them something that they can transfer, that they can take with them so that they become the instructor. They carry your lesson. They teach your lesson for you. They tell your stories for you. And that is how your message multiplies. And it can be taken all the way to places like Southern California, Tokyo, Portugal, Singapore, Capri. And yes, Bill, thank you very much for summarizing that for me. Well, my fantasy land about 25 years ago was Alaska. After sitting in the Mojave Desert, it was hot, it was ugly, it was boring. I wanted to go someplace cold and beautiful and exciting, and I chose Alaska. And once I got out in the summer of 2000, I moved up there. If you had been there with me, <laughs> next to me on that airplane, touching down at Anchorage International Airport, you would have seen a mid-sized city surrounded on water by three sides, Chugach Mountain Range off to the east. As that plane touched down, I said, this is where I plant my flag. No more barracks, no more military uniforms, no more Z-100. 
just me and the midnight sun lighting up a future that has no limits. And it went well for a while. So taking classes at the university, walk, working part-time. Classes started to get boring, so I went to work full-time selling exercise equipment. And that's actually first delivering and installing. I got promoted to uh, sales. And that was my entry into the fitness industry. Doing very well for myself, moved out of the roommate situation and got my own two-bedroom apartment, bought a new car. Then after about a year, I looked around and there was that voice telling me, Mike, you can't work retail forever. So after the Christmas rush, I left the store. I went back to work. And in only one semester, I went back to college. In only one semester, I blew through most of my savings. After the semester, I needed a quick infuse of cash. So I went to a little town called Bethel, looking for some day labor. I want to give you a little bit of advice. If you ever thought about moving to Alaska or living or traveling to Alaska, here's my advice. Don't go to Bethel. <laughs> but there was an opportunity for some day labor there. So I went out there and somebody suggested, Mike, why don't we rent out the local lodge? We can do a, a fitness workshop and diabetes prevention, and we can charge between $20 and $50, depending on how long it is. I said, People won't pay just to hear me talk about exercise. And she said, oh, yes, they will. Bethel's a small town, but it's a hub for about 60 native villages in the area. A lot of state workers there with good paying jobs. They have the money, but they don't have any fitness facilities out there. They would love to have a trainer come in from the big city of Anchorage and teach them some things about fitness. And my two passions in life back then, just as they are now, are presenting and the fitness industry. So this is perfect. You want to hear about the seminar we did? There was no seminar. I chickened out. I was a certified trainer. I was the president of my Toastmasters club, but I was in my mid-20s back then. All I knew how to do was spew my opinions. I didn't have any system in place to put together a presentation like you're hearing now. I didn't know about the systems, the process of the modules, the audience engagement. I knew none of it. Even though it's something I always wanted to do, I had the venue, I had the audience, I had somebody to set it up. It would have paid me enough money. I could have stayed in Alaska a little bit longer while I found something full time. Instead, I went back to Anchorage empty handed. And I looked around that apartment and I said, I, I can't afford this anymore. And I packed up the car and I went back to New York. Now it was a fun road trip. I was happy to be back in New York, but it was a failure. This is a lifelong dream that faded into a short memory, all because I didn't take that step to put together that presentation. To this day, when I see something on the Travel Channel, the Discovery Channel about Alaska, it still hurts. Today, today I don't really get to see the Chugach Range or anything like it. Instead, I hang my hat in Lima, Peru. Now, the hills behind me now are not quite as majestic as the Chugach Mountain Range, but it's a lot warmer here. And, you know, when the sun sets, it hits the hills at a certain angle, told, turns them a golden color, and just reminds me of things are much better now. Having put together Fit Presenter, the number one resource for public speaking in the fitness industry. I can do this here. I can do this anywhere. Do you know how I got this far? It didn't come from waiting around for 20 years. Like I told you, I was an econ major. I went back to New York, finished my education, but is there a demand in Bethel, Alaska for the? Yeah, Russ, if you want to go back to Bethel and give the presentation, just rent out the lodge. I'll see what I can do for you. <laughs> you <laughs> I always say that. Maybe but you can, <laughs> but like I said, I you can even do it virtually too. You can even do it virtually. You don't have to be there. Uh, they probably need you to be there. It's that's the whole okay. thing. Is they're very cooped up, real, real community based, and so are they here. And so are they here in Lima. And I know I can do this. This came from, like I said, I was an econ major, and 
I still, once I graduated, fitness was still my passion. So I went back to the gym and worked as a personal trainer, one client at a time, one hour at a time till I filled out my schedule. And that grind will never show up on a resume, but it did get the attention of the principal of the Career Institute. And she said to me one day, Mike, how would you like to teach the certification course for fitness trainers? One minute in front of that classroom, I knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. And that's when I rededicated to teaching and speaking and of course, the fitness industry, it has taken me decades, thousands of dollars, thousands of hours. This entire journey has cost me more than my master's degree. And I don't want you to have to take 20 years. I don't want you to have to spend over $20,000. And that's why I've packaged everything up in a six-week program. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to put my calendar and I'd love for you to book with me. This is being recorded, most likely end up on YouTube. So I don't want to be specific on what I'm going to do for you. The package is six weeks, but if you book with me today, I've got a little extra sweetener for you. So I'm going to put that in the, I'm going to put that here in the, in the chat. You can book with me. There are a couple of questions they are all about speaking and business. So I have a better idea, but I also want to, if, in the meantime, something a lot shorter. In speaking, don't be stingy as far as who you learn from. But one person is going to stand out for you as your mentor. And for me, that was Craig Valentine, 1999 world champion of public speaking. And he, The first time I heard him, I said, that's the guy. It's just something about him. And in the last few years, I got to know Craig very well. And he's just salt of the earth kind of person. And Craig and I have collaborated on the essentials of storytelling. When I tell people about the fit system, they usually come back and say the I is the thing that resonates with them most, telling stories. So everything that goes into telling the stories you've heard today and the stories that you're going to share with your audience, we package it all up into one module called the, the essentials of storytelling. It's 80 minutes. You can get through it all in one sitting. And the lessons, obviously, is to be listened to on a regular basis. That will make the difference in taking your stories up to world class. Again, if you sign, it's a $50 module. If you sign on and you order it today, I'm going to sweeten it by, I'm going to give you some coaching, complimentary. You send me a video of up to 10 minutes. I just upgraded my Dropbox. I want you to put it to use. Send me a video of up to 10 minutes, and I will give you the feedback as a certified world-class speaking coach. There are fewer than 300 of us in the world, even fewer than that working full-time and only one of them directly in front of you right now. I do have one more story to close with, but I would like to take any questions that you have and then we can finish up. You can hands up or you can, you can unmute yeah. yourself. Am I still involved in Toastmasters? Yes, Mark, I am the member of two clubs Summarize the fit system. Okay, the fit system first. Filter is the filter their misconceptions away from their background knowledge. So this water is the background knowledge. Acknowledge that they bring a certain amount of knowledge with them. And then just identify the misconceptions that exist within their background knowledge. Rather than be one of those speakers that says, well, everything you learned is wrong. No, something you learned is wrong but acknowledge their background knowledge. And then of course, instructor and then instruct with stories and transfer the lesson, give them a phrase they can repeat. So they tell your stories. Okay. <clears throat> All right, Russ, DTM. Awesome. Congratulations. Yes. I'm involved in Toastmasters. I'm in two clubs, one here in Lima. I am the vice president of public relations and I am the president of the Toastmasters at Palm Beach state college. Last year I spoke at the district I competed at the district level. I'm making another run. You get me in my humble beginnings phase. You have any more questions about the FIT system, about Alaska, about Lima, Peru? Great place to visit. By the way, Lake Titicaca. Yes. Lake Titicaca is much nicer than Machu Picchu, by the way. Nice. What, um, what more can you tell us about the fitness and particularly, in, and, and also about Alaska? But, well, I haven't been to Alaska in 20 years, but it's very cold. Don't go there now. 
you know, uh, well, listen, Alaska is the biggest land mass of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And most people want to take a cruise there. <laughs> and that's what, uh, but stay away from the cruise ships, go on mainland, take a road trip, yeah. go to the, go to the Kenai Peninsula, Alaska. There's some places you want to go on a tour, make sure you see anything. You go to the Holy Land, you want to make sure you see the right sites. You don't want to just go to Pizza Hut. But Alaska, just go and look at it. Denali, yes, Denali Park. Okay, Denali State Park is better than that. Denali National Park. There's a tip. How did I come up? And you touch on how did it originally with fit. Obviously, fit, fit presenter, it's a dual meaning. The idea is this, is you've got to play off your audience. Now, like Elvis says, you've been a beautiful audience, a wonderful audience here. You create this experience every bit as much as I do. And that's the whole focus is to put the focus on your audience. Not, I'm not talking much about me. I am now because I told you everything you need to know, talking about my travels. and But you don't want to talk about you and your material as much as your audience. You always want that. So the three principles are, number one, to acknowledge their misconceptions, which in fitness is huge. Stories have to be the basis of what you do and give them something to take away. If there's another premise that I always include and when I'm doing more one-on-one uh, -on -one training is that you ask the right questions to your audience and then let them answer the questions. If not out loud, at least think about an answer. What's the most important lesson you've ever learned in your life to one? I like pizza. Look, let them <laughs> Let them think of an answer and then include their answers in your presentation. That's so important when people ask a question to their audience and then they never, you know, they don't, they don't care about the answer. You know, do you like pizza? Well, I love pizza. Let me talk about myself. Why'd you ask me? That, that's probably the other premise that is not in the fit system, but in my coaching, it's, it's always there. It's audience focus. Questions about Peru, Alaska. Oh, if you ever come I, to, I, have, I was just going to say I have a friend friend from there, and and um, a, a church I was part of had a had a mission there, and and to Lima, and they talked a lot about the tenements, about the tents, tenement uh, play locations, dwellings that they were. Of course, well, you know, it's a funny thing what happened is about thirty years ago, the the terrorists out in the provinces, so a lot of people fled the city, had nowhere to go. I fled the, the the provinces, had nowhere to go, came to the city. And so that's kind of how things grew out. But Lima is a beautiful city. It's, how much is my coaching? Well, that, that depends. We, we've got to meet on and talk about that. Well, plus, and the thing is, as a, um, in the fitness industry, I have an advanced package that's for implementing workshops in your fitness facility. And that costs more than what I charge for just individual coaching. Well, let's hop on a call. Mm -hmm. All right. Any last questions? We have Mike for one more minute. Well, I went by quickly. Oh, it's fun. Yeah. I'm going to ask you also check out my website at fitpresenter.com and you can get on my mailing list once a week. No more, no crazy spam. It's... And I would really love for you to check out the website, check out the blog. I put a lot of work into that blog. Get a lot of tips there. And then just get yourself your complimentary speaking kit, it's six pages, and then you'll get on my mailing list once a week. You'll get something on Sundays on speaking tips. We're in Lima. Yes, I'm uh, I'm in the line between Ate and La Molina. Now, La Molina is kind of a high society place, and I'm in Ate. I'm on the other side of the street from the rich people. There's this huge grass divider between. On the other side of the street, they mow the grass once a week. And here they do like every three months. So you can tell which side. I used to live on the other side of the street in La Molina. And now I'm in Ate with the common folk. We get better We get better restaurants. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mike. This has been really helpful. I had a really yeah, fun time. Yeah, Hope definitely. you did as well. Um, any last words before we um, say goodbye? Follow me on LinkedIn. Let me put my LinkedIn in here too. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I hope you have a good weekend. Thanks for joining us. Um, we will please reach out to Mike, uh, connect with him everywhere and take him up on his offer. It sounds really amazing. So yeah, cool. um, thank you guys.
have a great weekend and we'll see you in two weeks. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye, see you.